So, well, I don't see my life as normal, but probably nobody does. Um, so I'm a neuroscientist, I'm a brain researcher, and my main occupation is being a professor in a university where I do research in my lab and I also teach. So I'm surrounded by students and uh, interesting people. I'm very lucky in that way. Um, and I also have a recent uh, startup. Uh, we opened a startup company a year ago to treat depression with games uh, on the phone, like apps that are based on research I've done while I was still a professor at Harvard University and now back in Israel. Uh, so my life is, um, I write a lot, not only books, but you know, papers and opinions for newspapers and uh, go over manuscripts with students and collaborators. Uh, do research in the lab, uh, go to the company and, and work with game designers and things like this. I also have uh, kids that I love more than anything else and I spend time with. I like to run on the beach. I do yoga. I go to trans parties. <laughs> it's all, uh, <laughs> it's very diverse. Well, it's hard to concentrate, not only because many of us suffer from uh, attention deficit disorder, also because we are being bombarded by uh, stimulation from all around, you know, our phone, of course, but people around, uh, traffic, uh, sights, colors, sounds, smells. So it just becomes more and more um, intense. And... I don't really have a cure for uh, the, the hustle and bustle of, of life around us other than doing, you know, suggesting what I'm doing, which is finding time to be alone. And as I mentioned, also running is a, is a big uh, uh, remedy for this. The real, or oh, one of the, of the hopes I had when writing this book is to actually help people come to terms with their inability to focus because the mind is really is like a wild animal. Toro, how do you say? Uh, 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 say uh, a bull? A bull, yeah, you call it Toro? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my father is Spanish, but I don't, I don't know much, uh, uh, many words. So the mind is like a wild beast. It really is, uh, is very intense. And what I tried to achieve with this book was also to let people understand, to help them understand that not only that it's natural that the mind drifts, but also that it's very useful. So in some cases, you don't want to drift and you don't want to wander too much because you know, people that worry a lot and they have a lot of stress or ruminations like in depression and anxiety, then you don't want to be staying with your thoughts. But otherwise this drifting serves important functions such as planning, simulating possible scenarios for the future so that you can anticipate your actions, um, incubating and thinking about creative ideas. So there's a lot of purpose for this drifting where society has kind of taught us uh, to fight this and to feel guilty about not being on target all the time. But I think uh, being on target all the time is bad for you. We're not machines, you know, and, and we can achieve a lot by not being on target and instead drifting to places where we come back with uh, great ideas. Oh, not at all. What, what, what I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, in mindfulness and I am finding myself at least once a year in a week of silence, Vipassana retreat. But really I try to distinguish different forms of experiences. So it is very good, you know, when you're eating a mango or when you're listening to your daughters telling you a story from school or when you're with, when you're with your girlfriend or when you're at the beach, you want to be in the moment. You do want to be mindful. So when I look at a flower, I want to be looking at the flower and enjoy the colors and, and the intricacies of nature. But if we're always mindful and if we're always at the, at the present, then, you know, in one extreme, I can say we'll be run over by a bus very quickly because our being in the present, meaning that you do not use your past, the brain really 
the number one thing that the brain wants to do is to anticipate, to be able to minimize uncertainty. So we want to know what's coming next. In order to know what's coming next, we have to go back to our memory, think about similar experiences from the past, and then project them to the future. We call it mental time travel. So you take your past, similar experiences, you modify them, you project them to the future, and this is a prediction of what to anticipate in future scenarios. So if you're always mindful, and when I'm going to these retreats, I challenge the, the gurus there. and say, how did you plan your flight here, right? If you're always in the present, you can't be thinking about the future. So there are good times to be mindful, like the examples I provided, but other times it's good not to be in the present actually, and to be thinking ahead so that you can plan and you can utilize your experience so that you can be better prepared for the future. So I really not trying to say anything against mindfulness, but rather to say that we need to distinguish what's the situation, what, what is this, the best state of mind, I call it, to be in, depending on the context. Some states of mind are more mindful and more in the present. Some states of mind require thinking about the past. Some require center, certainty. Some are more exploratory and are okay with less certainty. So um, it really is, is almost like a guide for distinguishing what mind do you need to bring to what situation. It's a good question. I do find myself sometimes when I'm in these forums of uh, yoga and, and, uh, and meditation uh, to be maybe the only scientist, but not anymore. I mean, this is something that's been studied more and more. First of all, I, I do consider myself to be a very open-minded person. It already only served me well. I've encountered things that I would have not encounter, encountered if I were a closed-minded, you know, very disciplined person. So my uh, messy mind is also a mind that, that is more likely to encounter opportunities and, and interesting novelties. Well, yoga, I don't see yoga as a spiritual thing. Yoga is really... I see it's a physical amazing thing, but also it's a sort of meditation. Just there are some types of yoga that that really are forcing you to be in the moment. It's almost like a body scan technique where you can you think about your body all the time. And even in meditation, you know, I kind of take the spiritual aspect out of it. It's not a religion for me, and it's not something where I aspire to understand the theories behind. I have you know theories I have in science. But at the same time, if we're scientists that were limited to the lab, then we'll be limited with our observations, with the questions that you can ask. So if there is a practice like meditation that has lasted for so many, I don't know, thousands of years, then my mind tells me there's, there's got to be something there and let's explore it. And even when I try to go to these retreats, not being a scientist, when I'm there, I'm trying not to be too critical. Like, and I come back home and I think about what insights I've gained, and then I put them in a the book. But, uh, you know, I don't go to the forest and start believing in angels and, and all kind of, you know, uh, spiritual stuff that is unfounded. But I am open to things that kind of nourish the soul and the body. And uh, so I, I really don't see it as a contradiction. Yes, yeah, so... Uh, actually, I'm very uh, aware of my inability to to be to focus to concentrate, mm -hmm. and also my kids inherited it from me. And another, so one other thing I'm trying to do in this book, and I, from the feedback I've received, I feel very rewarded, is that to show the advantages of not being on target, of not being focused. Again, we are obsessed to oh, I can't focus on this uh, thing. I, I I keep on moving, but. I find a lot of advantages for not being too focused. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, it could be like I'm trying to convince myself that, well, you know, a disadvantage is an advantage. But what it comes down to at the end is the realization that there are different minds. People are different, not only in personality, but, you know, some people that are good at focus uh, are good for specific tasks or specific professions. And other people that their mind is all over the place are maybe better for professions where you require, uh, you know, you prefer 
creativity over systematic thinking, you know, more parallel than, than linear. I don't think there's better mind, one is better than the other. I think they're just like states of mind that I mentioned, they are each good for different purposes. And even without the ability to focus too much, we can achieve things. You know, I sit in my kids and I resisted giving them medications, even though sometimes it, it might be a good solution, but with my kids at the end, because you still accomplish things. And when things interest you enough, you're able to focus. I mean, the fact is that I wrote this long book does require a lot of attention, but it is achieved in some, you know, in parallel, uh, multiple ways. So, uh, so yeah, it's a, uh, I'm just I just learned to accept my my uh, limitation and attention and actually seeing it as an advantage. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a single moment of epiphany. Oh my God, I need to write a book. Uh, really, it, it's it's almost boring. I mean, I wrote something on an airplane after my first uh, week of silence. I had some uh, burst of uh, insights. And I was flying back from New York and I wrote something that was then published in the New York Times. It's called Think Less, Think Better. Uh, it was, I think, 2016. And it made a lot of waves. Uh, people uh, read about it and were affected by it and wrote to me. And it seemed very clear that there is an interest in, in you know, our mind and how it wanders and why it wanders. So... Um, so then, you know, came the idea of, you know, an agent spoke with me, a great agent that that uh, uh, suggested that I write a book. And then, you know, just uh, gradually became a big project, uh, which I love in retrospect. But it's not like, oh, I'm going to write a book. It's It was kind of one thing led to another. It's a great tendency. I love it that the general population is interested in their brain. And this has been a trend already, you know, more than 10 years, maybe 20 years, both here in Israel and in the US where I used to live for many years. So there are many bestsellers that are based on, on, on brain science. Of course, it has to be written in a general uh, level, but, and, and I really love this interest. I think that people are curious about their mind, but they're also curious about possibility of taking control of their mind not in a bad way, but just like some people would like to focus more, some people would like to direct their mind to this type of thoughts or other type of thoughts. And we want to understand why we're good at this and not at that. Why do we remember faces or forget faces? People ask, you know, they, because we realize over the years, we realize that, you know, our brain is who we are and we have to understand it in a way that will give, give us better understanding of, of who we are. Um, so it really it happens across the world, and, and I'm very happy about it, and I'm very happy that that we as neuroscientists can translate our science to uh, uh, the general uh, public so that the other people can benefit from, from whatever we've learned over the last decades. I think I summarize it very concisely, both in the introduction and in the summary, but Maybe because I'm not a focused person, there's more than one focus to the book. So uh, maybe one or two we already covered, which is mind wandering is not necessarily bad. Drifting and not attending is not necessarily bad. The brain, see, we are wandering, our mind drifts for about 50% of our waking hours. Think about it. Half of the time that you're awake, your mind is not where you are. I think it's a stunning number that, that like, even now, when we talk, part of our mind thinks about what's going to happen after this interview and, you know, maybe thinking about the past or maybe you remind me something or, right? So our mind always travels. And evolution, will, and this takes a lot of energy. When we think, you know, it requires metabolic energy. The brain requires, you know, 20% of the energy of the entire body. And from this half of the time, we're dedicating this energy for drifting. If you believe in evolution, you realize that it must play some kind of a role, some kind of a function. And we as scientists started for the last two decades to explore what is the function of this uh, drifting. And we realized that it does all this planning and mental simulations and, and, and uh, creative thinking. So this is one big message that mind wandering is not necessarily bad. And uh, in fact, it's mostly good.
and we need to respect it. We need to understand uh, uh, the different types. Second thing maybe is the state of mind I was talking about. Even the same person can be more creative or less creative, better mood or worse mood, more exploratory, exploring new new uh, environments or more exploitatory, exploiting some the familiarity. So being able to understand that I'm not a fixed person, but rather my mind is dynamic, just like the pupil of the eye can expand when there's not enough light and shrinks when there's uh, too much light, our entire mind can change the state of mind depending on the context. It's not always perfect. That's why we need to understand what is the best state of mind for the best situation so that we can minimize friction between you know, our mind and actions and the environment. And maybe a third, there are many bottom lines and focuses there, but maybe the third one I'll list here is different types of experience. And this ties it also to, to mindfulness. So I list in the book three types of perspectives to take when you're experiencing everyday life, you know, whatever experience you have, let's say this experience of both of us talking with each other. I can be... Uh, I can be drifting, thinking about something else while you talk, and you know, I just go somewhere else. So I'm not in the experience at all. I can I can be mindful and say, okay, now uh, Antonio is moving his hand and he has a finger on his cheek on his uh, chin and he's smiling. And I kind of narrate, I'm aware of everything, right? I'm mindful. I see these little bricks behind her and I like this style and think about these little details. I'm mindful of all the elements. So this is mindfulness. And the third case, I think, is the most interesting and the one that we we should strive to, to have as much of as possible is the study that I call immersion. So I'm not only in the present, I'm completely in the experience so that I don't even observe us from the side and say to, uh, no, we're having conversation, it's nice, and Antonio is listening, and it's recording, and blah, blah, blah. No, it's it's really I'm in the experience itself. Imagine that you're sitting on a roller coaster, something that's really thrilling. You don't think about the past, you don't think about the future, you don't tell yourself, oh, now we're going up, now we're going down. You're just in the experience, you're going crazy in the experience. So imagine if you could do this when you eat a mango or when you talk with your girlfriend or when you're swimming, right? You're completely in the experience, just like in a roller coaster. So these different perspectives on an experience really have profound effects on how we live our lives and how we experience our lives. I have to admit that I really love writing. Not everybody likes it so much. It doesn't mean that it's easy all the time, but I am happy to write, okay? Uh, I do my writing while lying in bed and my laptop is on my chest. This is how I write the best. Um, Yes, yeah, so I don't shy away from writing, and this really became uh, most of my profession. Uh, most, most of what I do is either I read or I write. Um, and when I write, especially on a popular level, but also when I write scientific papers, I always think about the reader. I know it sounds like a cliche, but I'm trying to think to anticipate what will the reader understand this word? Is it too jargony or too specific? Is this going to pique their interest and they'll be curious and they want to read the next sentence? Is this something ambiguous? Do I want to make it sharper? So I always get into my, my uh, reader's mind and try to anticipate and make it as interesting and as clear as possible. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's my relationship to writing. <laughs>